come into the um, to come into the Zoom room, and we'll get started shortly. Good evening, everyone. Um, as, as if you're just joining us, we're going to get started in about um, 30 to 60 seconds, just allowing folks a bit of time to come into the into the Zoom room. And folks are still uh, are still logging on. Um, good evening, everybody. Um, thank you so much for um, being here, for joining us for today's discussion. Uh, our discussion today is, is, is entitled Change Can't Wait, a Justice and Equity Agenda for Boston's Black and Brown Communities. Um, I'm Janine Gonzalez, an Assistant Professor of Public Policy here at HKS. Um, and before we get started with our incredible uh, panelists, uh, I want to start with just a few housekeeping announcements on behalf of the Ash Center. Um, first, the Ash Center would like to acknowledge the land on which Harvard sits as the traditional territory of the Massachusetts people and a place which has long served as a site of meeting and exchange among nations. We'd also like to thank and acknowledge our co-sponsors for today's uh, discussion. Um, in addition to the Ash Center, this event is co-sponsored by the Carr Center for Human Rights Policy, the Center for Public Leadership, the FSB Center for Health and Human Rights, and the Rappaport Institute for Greater Boston. Um, just to let you know, today's event is being recorded and the video will uh, subsequently be made publicly available on the uh, YouTube channel of the Ash Center. Um, you are welcome to submit questions at any time throughout the duration of the event. Um, and please do so during the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen, uh, rather than doing so during the chat. And I'll be reminding you of this uh, over the course of our, of our time together. Um, now I'd like to pass it over to my fellow moderator, um, David Corby, to introduce himself and say a few words. Hello all, my name is David Corby and I'm a Master of Public Administration candidate at the Kennedy School. Thank you all, a big thank you for joining us today for a very important conversation. Really quickly, I was born and raised in Boston and after working in community organizations and city government, I've seen firsthand the dire inequities that persist in our city for black and brown communities from the abysmal racial wealth gap to the ever-present vestiges of the Boston busing crisis, it is woefully apparent that there are still deep racial wounds that manifest in communal disparities. Whereas all previous Boston mayors have been white males, our next mayor will certainly be a woman and possibly a person of color. There's a dire urgency for change that the black and brown communities are calling for. Change is coming, but how do we ensure that now greater than any time before that the needs of the black and brown communities are highly prioritized by the next mayor's policy agendas? That the promises made during the campaign trail move beyond inspirational rhetoric and manifest itself into substantial policies. This is why we're here and why this moment is so important. Um, and this is why change can't wait. And, I'm really excited to be in, in, in this conversation with such an amazing panel. And I wanna thank the Ash Center and the other HKS centers for sponsoring this important conversation. And 
really just, yep, yeah, overall enthused. And just really quickly, the last day to vote is November 2nd in the general election for this upcoming mayoral race. And the, the date is actually October 13th and it's at 8 p.m. So that is the last time you can actually register to vote. So please go out and vote. If you wanna know your registration status, we're going to include the link in the chat, but it's nas.org, can I vote slash voter registration status. And if you're not registered to vote, we'll go do that. And you can go to iop.turbovote.org. Now I'm gonna hand it back over to my co-moderator to introduce the panelists. Thank you. Thank you so much, David. And I can't stress enough the importance of registering to vote and checking up on your registration status if you haven't done so already. I'm new to Boston and I just <laughs> finally um, uh, confirmed my voter registration. So I'm excited to, to be able to vote in these, in these upcoming elections. Um, so as, as David said, I'm, I'm, we are really fortunate to be joined by a um, really incredible set of, of, of community leaders, folks that are leading um, you know, essential questions uh, and essential work in, in Boston's black and brown communities. And so I'm gonna you know, quickly introduce each of them so that we can have as much time as possible from here to hear um, from them and their experiences um, and the, the wealth of knowledge that they're gonna share with us today. Um, so our first panelist is Paige Curtis. Um, Paige uh, is the culture and communications manager at the Boston Ujima Project, where she tells stories about the solidarity economy. Um, Paige is an Atlanta native, a daydreamer, a rabble rouser, and a third culture kid, uh, and she believes that a more equitable future is possible. Uh, Paige is formally trained in environmental management from the Yale School of Environment, and she's most excited by community-based solutions to the climate crisis. Really essential stuff. Um, and when she's not riding or biking around the city, Paige is in search of the perfect lobster lobster roll, and she's currently based in Cambridge, Massachusetts. Um, our next panelist is Sierra Peters. Sierra is the communications director at Boston Ujima Project, and she's an artist working across video, installation, text, and cultural organizing. And that is my daughter that you can hear in the background. Um, Sierra's recent projects include Print Ain't Dead, Converging Liberations Residency and the Black Feminist Study Hall. Uh, our next panelist is Christine Tagengua. Um, Christine is the Senior Program Director of the Mira Coalition's New American Integration Program. Um, as someone displaced by the 1994 genocide in her native Rwanda, Christine has a passion for helping immigrants and refugees settle in the United States. After graduating from the Divinity School in Kenya in 1999, she came to the United States in 2000, uh, earning a master's of social work from Boston University in 2012 and joining MIRA in July, 2014. Uh, she has over 10 years experience working in refugee and immigrant resettlement. Um, Christine has also served as a board member of the Chelsea Collaborative for three years and Umunara Inc. till the present. Um, she received the 2008 Unsung Heroine Award from the Massachusetts Office for Refugees and Immigrants in recognition of her work helping uh, quote, un uprooted people. Um, and our final panelist is James Mackey. James is a national activist, a social philanthropist, a motivational speaker, a community builder, and the founder of a grassroots movement called Stuck on Replay, an advocacy organization uplifting the voices of those disproportionately impacted by mass incarceration. He has a lifelong commitment to fighting against systems that continue to perpetuate, disenfranchise, and oppress black and brown people through laws, policies, and practices. He is devoted to positive youth development and engagement, mentoring and advocating the importance of allocating resources and opportunities to those who need it most. James is also a graduate fellow of the Institute for Nonprofit Management and Leadership at Tufts University and a recipient of numerous community recognition awards. So as you can see, we really have um, a remarkable uh, uh, set of perspectives and a, a wealth of experience to, to, to be sharing with today. Um, so very much looking forward to hearing from everyone. Um, now I turn it over to David to get the conversation started. Excellent. Well, I'm so happy and enthused to be joined by such an esteemed panel and really just starting off and introducing everybody to yourselves. Can you give us an overview of your work and also the work of your organization as a agent of social change in Boston's communities of color? And let's start it off with James. Yeah, peace, everybody. Um, thank you all for having me. I really appreciate this conversation, especially in this very important times. 
Um, and also want to apologize because y'all may be hearing uh, some babies screaming uh, as well as some TV uh, noise in the background. Listen, I'm a, I'm a father um, and I got to make sure I take care of my babies. Um, and so just want y'all to know that. But uh, the work, I wear many hats. Um, uh, so to be truthful, Stuck on Replay started back uh, in July of 2016. And it actually ended up being on a standstill um, in August 2018. And the reason for that was because there was a lot of work that happened over that two year span where we specifically were focused on really elevating voices and uplifting community and influencing policy around decisions around the injustice systems that was happening with that was happening uh, um, around us without us. Um, and folks know that there was a council, uh, a council that came in uh, to Massachusetts did the study um, and they weren't listening to community. And I felt it was extremely important and imperative for legislators and policymakers along with the council of state government to listen to the community uh, because we felt like if we did not step up or if the community wasn't able to be a part of this conversation, then we'll remain stuck on replay. And that's how that conversation, that's how uh, this movement really came about. Um, and we were specific around really engaging young people um, to understand the importance of like not being stuck and stagnant in this, you know, in society of being complacent and just continuing to allow systems to continue to oppress us, step on us um, and step over us without us. Um, and so with that, uh, we began to start challenging systems. We actually start showing up at hearings and disrupting uh, uh, hearings. We, you know, we, we also even played a major role in the ominous bill that passed in 2018 um, because of the important work of getting the community voice involved and not just our voice, like literally coming up with re like recommendations that actually were actually implemented um, on a state level. Um, uh, and so with that work, um, our last event that we did have was centered around who do you value? Um, who do we value? And that was really trying to get community and policymakers in the same space and for policymakers who were running for a specific position during that time frame. And that's when that's when Ayanna Presley uh, was running. That's when Rachel Rollins was running. That's when a whole bunch of uh, state representatives were running. And it was a historic moment. However, we wanted to make sure that uh, folks um, who were running for this specific position, who said that they want to represent you, we wanted to hear why you deserved that position to represent us on a federal, state, uh, or a municipal level. And for that, we, we really did phenomenal work um, and really changed the, the way community viewed politicians um, and put them on a pedestal, um, but see them as human. Uh, and we also were able to really get uh, uh, key uh, stakeholders around, around policymakers into the space to truly understand the value of, of working collectively together in unison with community. Um, and for that, we were definitely successful. Um, and so that has been the work that I have been focused on uh, since since uh, 2018. Um, but uh, it, it transitioned from just being stuck on replay to a whole bunch of other things. Um, but yet and still, we will be reigniting stuck on replay in 2022. So be on the lookout for it. Um, but other than that, man, this is this is what it's all about, really trying to challenge people who have been in position for too long and have been comfortable, making them feel uncomfortable with having the voice of those who have been marginalized um, to be at the forefront and making those decisions as well. Thank you, James. Yeah, you're such a powerful ally and just such a powerful advocate. So thank you for all your work. Okay, next, uh, Paige, do you mind sharing? Yes, of course. Thank you, David. I think we're actually matching tonight, which is cool and totally not planned. Um, but thank you so much for having us tonight. Once again, my name is Paige. I'm the Culture and Communications Manager at the Boston Ujima Project. Um, so at Ujima, my role is really to manage and support our broad 
portfolio of communications and cultural programming um, that we do uh, across Boston, really, and online. Um, so we are a Black-led, Democratic, member-run organization building cooperative economic infrastructure in Boston. So that's a lot of words, but our, our, our broad mission really is to return wealth to the working class communities of color in the city. And so we do that by bringing together um, neighbors, workers, business owners, investors, a lot of grassroots organizers and cultural makers to create this community controlled economy that I think we all wanna see in Boston. And so our work is really about trying to solve for a lot of material needs, but it's also a, bro a broader transformation that we're trying to achieve here. Um, and so we do this work through our Ujima staff, but also through our really large network of solidarity and voting members that we have across Boston and, and elsewhere who are our partners in this work, really. Um, so I wanted to highlight two elements of our work that I think are relevant here. We're really trying to build an ecosystem of sorts, but I wanted to kind of call out two specific aspects of that that I think are really important to just think about um, in this. And, and first is our Good Business Alliance. So we really believe that locally owned businesses and cooperatives play an essential role in moving towards this broader vision of community control, right? So as um, folks who create wealth, they create jobs, um, they offer vital services and have and offer spaces to gather, we really want to support local business. So we have an Ujima Good Business Alliance that unites local businesses. It also provides um, support, um, tries to um, encourage accountability for shared values among these businesses, um, and really is a network of community-controlled businesses that are eligible for investment through our Democratic Investment Fund, the Ujima Fund. Um, so that's kind of one piece I wanted to talk about here. And the other piece I think is also important to note is our grassroots organizing that we do with partners. So again, I stress that we are we really believe in collaboration across um, every facet of this work. So we have a, a number of awesome partners that we um, collab with through campaigns for different organizing initiatives. Um, so I'll call out here two um, that you all might know, City Life Vida Urbana and the Matahari Women's Worker Center, who are doing uh, really important work around housing, housing justice and labor rights. Um, we have partners who work in youth empowerment and climate justice as well. So we do a lot of this work collaboratively and we're so excited to keep working on it. Thank you, Paige. Okay, Christine, do you mind sharing? Not at all. Um, again, my name is Christine and thank you for having me. Uh, my last name is Nagengwa. I am from refugee, Massachusetts Migrants and Refugee Advocates Coalition. Uh, our office is in Boston and uh, uh, Massachusetts Mira is most people know Mira Coalition, and uh, it um, has more than 130 uh, members. And we do advocacy, organizing, citizenship, integration. And the department where I work in, it's a new American integration program. It's an American program where uh, every year we have 30 members who are serving different organizations throughout Boston and uh, other areas of Massachusetts. Uh, and the members, they do teach English. They help uh, refugees and immigrants uh, in job readiness. And uh, those who have green cards, they help them to apply for uh, citizenship. So, um, and uh, my department started 2011, but Mira has been there for a long time. And uh, Mira has been fighting for different policies in a local level, state level, and the federal level, uh, as some of you know. And uh, the core mission of Mira is to make sure that they, their policies uh, which are inclusive to everyone, which are benefiting everyone. And we work with nonprofits, we work with leaders, we work with uh, businesses, people, all those people together, because we feel like uh, uh, together we can be able to have some changes in Massachusetts. So um, that's what we do um, at Mira. Thank you, Christine. And Sierra? Yeah, um, hi everyone. My name is Sierra Peters, she, they pronouns. Um, I'm a third generation Bostonian, um, but I'm currently residing on Lenape land in Brooklyn, the People's Republic of Brooklyn, as I like to call it. Um, I, as mentioned, I'm the communications director at Boston Ujima Project. I'm an artist and an organizer. Um, and I think my goal or my broad purview is making the revolution sexy and archiving our histories. Um, there's this quote by Barbara Smith that I really love where she says something like, uh, there's no way to like safely guarantee that we or our movements will survive long enough to become historical, safely historical, 
and that we must document ourselves now. And so that's how I see my work, um, particularly in uh, the organizing space as a communications director. Um, and I just wanted to guess, add on to what uh, Paige said about our ecosystem. Um, we make a lot of space for direct democracy through our community, um, community assembling um, processes and votes. Um, I think, again, as Paige said, it's important to call out that Ujima is truly super collaborative. So we launched in the spring of 2015 with like a year long cross cultural, cross sectoral study group that included 40 plus community le leaders, a lot of those from City Life, Feeder Urbana, Matahari, um, and others. Um, and so we were formally launched in 2017. Um, and in 2018, we launched the Ujima Fund. Um, I think that it's important to call out the Ujima Fund because it's our democratic investment vehicle, the first in the US um, that's raising capital to finance like small businesses, retail, um, sorry, real estate and retail um, and infrastructure projects. Um, every voting member has one vote as to where they'd like the Ujima Fund to invest. And in order to be a voting member, you have to be a working class citizen of color living in Boston. Um, and I think like our primary belief is that to face the systems of inequity and poverty, we need creative interlocking systems and tools and strategies, right? Um, and so we really allow our members to see the possibility and the benefits of a non-capitalist uh, community controlled economy. Um, you know, so we host these neighborhood and citywide assemblies with like hundreds of residents, um, businesses, employers, workers, um, and we set investment priorities and vote on those investments to achieve community goals. Um, and I think, again, like it's important to call out here that like Ujima is not the only one, like we exist in a long lineage of black led mutual aid movements and planning initiatives. Assemblies are not new. Um, we've been doing assemblies since the turn of the century. Um, and honestly, we've been doing mutual aid since our ancestors first made contact with the Western hemisphere, right? Um, so like in South America in the Caribbean in the US, like this work is being done contemporarily in so many contexts. Um, and I think that what I hope will be a thread through this conversation is that we're building on the expertise of our communities that they've created through their lived experience um, and their active study of our current condition. Like we know what we need. Um, and so obviously, you know, the cultural shift that we want is in how we like live, play, eat and interact with our economies. Um, and we want people to understand that um, we're engaging with our communities deeply had be held beliefs. Um, and, you know, we want Ujima to be a compelling invitation and we don't want it to be dismissive or didactic or to talk down to anyone. Um, you know, if people feel moved by this then they'll join us, um, but we know that we must create the air that we're walking in um, to positively impact what is considered normal and what is considered possible. Like we know that a cultural shift will, you know, as Paige said, transform us and our communities. Thank you, Sierra. Really, it's such a powerful group of change agents. It's, it's really amazing. I mean, I wrote down some notes and some real key words that came to mind or even some phrases that were said, you know, education, empowerment, economic empowerment being important, resilience. I, I really like making revolution sexy. That's, that definitely needs to be on the shirt. Um, but I think just what I find commonality amongst you all is really just providing voices to the voiceless, you know, being that servant for the people that really thinks beyond yourself and really tries to give your all in order to see other people thrive and see other people be happy and live the quality of life that they should. Um, so again, cannot say how beautiful of a group this is. And now I'm gonna pass it over to my co-moderator for the next question. Thank you. Um, thanks, thanks, David, and um, thank you all for uh, those really wonderful uh, introductions. It's, it's to your, you know, I, I'm sure it's only just a slight introduction to all the incredible amount of work that you are all doing and, and have already done. And I want to, like David said, I want to weave together a couple of the threads um, that came out of, you know, your first um, set of remarks um, because some of the things that I think are really central to like the one, the type of work that. Um, we want to do through the what justice looks like series that that um, that you know David is thinking about doing as a student at, as, at HKS and as a Bostonian as and as all of you have been already doing um, is really centering the voices of communities um, that are directly affected by all these issues that we've been talking about and 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 highlighting um, and giving space to the expertise and experiences that they bring to the table. I mean, I think like just very moved by. Um, the way that James described, right, the kind of pedestal that we tend to put uh, people in power in um, to the detriment of hearing from the voices, the expertise, and the work that 
folks on the ground have been doing. Um, you know, as um, as Sierra was saying, you know, for centuries. Um, and so I think it's really, um, you know, exciting that, that this is, you guys are really making, doing that work in practice. You're really putting it into practice and they're not just words that, you know, these are not just sort of high level concepts. You're really thinking about how do you make that um, work on the ground leading from the ground. It reminds me of Ayanna Presley who often says, you know, people who are closer to the power, I'm sorry, closer to the pain not to be closest to the power. Um, and, and you guys are really giving an example to, to all the folks that are watching us um, of, of how to make that happen. Um, and so thinking along those lines and how, how to put the voices, experiences, expertise uh, of communities uh, front and center, uh, I wanted to hear from each of you what you think ought to be the top of the agenda for the next mayor. What are some of the challenges that, that you face in your work um, that, are, that you see facing communities that you think really need to be the prior, a key priority um, for the next mayor. Um, and so I think maybe what we can do is flip the order up a bit. Um, why don't we start with Christine um, and then we hear from Paige um, and James and Sierra. Thank you so much. Um, I, I think the first thing the mayor should think about is the refugees. Uh, the, 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 the people who come here and they don't speak English, the language barrier, if all of us here Someone can drop us in a country where we are not able to communicate. We are stuck. We can't do anything. So refugees and immigrants need the support, need, need a, a place where they go to learn English so they can be able to communicate. Uh, so I would like to see the mayor just uh, support those organizations who help refugees and immigrants to learn English uh, so they can be able to get jobs. And so that the next step is just to make sure that there's opportunities, job opportunities for refugees and immigrants. We all know Boston is very expensive. And if you don't have a decent job, it's very hard to live in Boston. I was reading somewhere that black people are being drawn outside of Boston because Boston is getting very expensive. And there's lack opportunity uh, to wait uh, wealth opportunity to have the black people to own their houses. And I, I feel like what black people are going through the refugees and immigrants, they face, face that double because first of all, they can't communicate because of the language. Yes, so not, not all of them who don't speak English. There are some who speak English, but the language barrier is a problem. The lack of employment opportunities, good employment. Some refugees and immigrants, when they get here, they do two, three jobs, four jobs to be able to support for their families. That's what my husband did when we came here in 2000. He was doing three jobs so he can be able to feed his family. So. Uh, good jobs for refugees and immigrants and for all Bostonians, especially people of color. And then housing. Housing is the key. When you, we have roof over our heads, we can be able to sit and think and be able to go to work peacefully. But we have seen so many homelessness in Boston area. It's a shame when I see those in America, we have homeless people. So I want the mayor, the future mayor, to think about that. We should end homelessness in Boston area. And I'm sure those homeless people have refugees and immigrants among them. Because in this country, if you can't be able to afford to work for one month or two months, most of the people, the majority, you end up being a homeless. So housing issues, let's have affordable housing opportunity for refugees and immigrants, for people of color, so we can have a better Boston. And if we can be able to do that, those three language barriers, lack of opportunity, job opportunity for refugees and immigrants, if we can be able to just be able to, to, to fix that housing issues, we'll have better. Also, and for you to know, those who are hearing, refugees and immigrants, they hold the key in, the, in our economy. They, they create better jobs. They create businesses. So let not the, lift them behind. Let the, lift them up. And I want the, the, the next mayor to make sure they think about the refugees and immigrants. Thank you so much for that, Christine. I mean, I think um, given recent events um, with, you know, sort of Afghanistan and um, Haitian migrants at, at the border as well, I think the question of refugees um, is really is really central, and it's one that you, as you brought to our attention, it's it's something that is a local issue that you know mayors really need to take seriously. And I love the way that you've woven together the importance of language justice um, with with economic justice. I think that that's 
um, you know, for those of us, for, for those of us with it from immigrant backgrounds, it's something that, that we know quite well, but that um, perhaps is not as, as obvious to others. Um, um, Paige, would you like to chime in on this as well? Sort of how, what do you see as some of the biggest challenges that you're facing um, in your work and in, in the communities that you work with? Um, and how can that, you know, what, what ought to be at the top of the agenda for the next mayor? Yeah, thank you so much for this question. I wanna really plus one and echo what Christine shared in terms of really wanting to support um, immigrant and refugee community as the economy builders that they are. We definitely agree with that, um, that principle. I guess to add to, or to sort of drill down into her point around um, housing, I would definitely echo the need for, the need to address the rampant displacement that's happening across Boston. Um, we've been talking about this for a long time in terms of the lack of affordability for housing in the city is still an issue. I think it's still, it's, it's time now to make some progress on it finally. Um, Obviously, Boston is still a city that is rapidly gentrifying in the U.S. and communities of color need and deserve stable housing in the pandemic and beyond. Um, and we know that, you know, rising rents and joblessness in light of COVID especially have led to uh, evictions especially. So um, thinking about as those moratoriums on evictions expire, what's going to happen next in terms of stable housing is a big question um, for us. And one of our grassroots partners, City Life Vida Urbana, is organizing heavily in that housing space. So definitely um, those of you who have interest in that work, um, get in contact with those folks. Um, and last piece perhaps connects to what Sierra was talking about earlier in terms of supporting the cultural economy as well. So really wanting to support artists and culture workers who add so much to the city, um, you know, trying to uh, ensure that they get to get fair wage and access to resources and their grants without so many strings attached to it, that they also have access to affordable housing as artists. Um, and economy, economy builders as well is really um, important. Um, yeah, thank you so much, Paige. And again, you're weaving together some um, key issues that we often don't, may not think about together, sort of, you know, sort of cultural work, artistic work, and um, of course the importance of, of sort of, um, of housing and, and all of that. Um, do uh, I think, oh yes, up next, um, I'd love to hear from James as well, sort of what you think um, is, is some of the key challenges um, in your work um, that you, if you could just call the next mayor up, to be, you, that you would say, this is what uh, you need to be working on? Uh, yeah, no, that's a great question. Um, you know, uh, in, in a very interesting time, um, to be truthful, I echo what uh, my sister said, and I will also add, you know, that For instance, there there was a Black Men and Boys Commission on a, on a city level that just passed through legislation, which is great. Uh, however, there is no money in the budget for this commission. Um, and uh, I think that it's important to, you know, if folks wanna not only just pass laws uh, to show that they value us, they will put some money behind it. And I think that not only just this commission, but to Black folk, uh, across Boston, whether it be for first home time, both first um, home time um, buyers, uh, you know, I, um, access to opportunities similar to that. Um, it, whether it, if it's you know um, uh, to find meaningful employment that that to, that's that's that you don't have to work two to three jobs in order to make sure that your family can eat and live in a, a, a nice livable space so your kids can la like can play and, and can, can do what it is that other kids do um, that have uh, uh, been fortunate to do for centuries off the backs of, um, of our labor. Uh, I we, we really need, um, to be truthful, I don't really have a major ask, but we need that bag. We need money, and, and I'm talking millions, possibly billions, and just it, that's what it is. And I'm 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 really I'm I'm talking about black folk because all, ultimately every time there's money that's funneling through the, the federal, the state, or the municipal level, um, we end up being last, and that I think that's done strategically, um, and I think that we need to dismantle that. Uh, and I would ask that the mayor in the first 100 days improve the quality of life for black folk across 
my Boston. And so that's that's my question. That's the um the uh, the request that I would ask. Yeah, and, and it's an important one, right? I mean, I think cities all over the country we're seeing, um, you know, from Evanston and Illinois and, and some spots in, in California, um, you know, folks are talking about reparations um, at a local level. And that's a really important question that, um, to, to be raised. So I think it's, you know, a central one to um, to bring to, to, to our new mayor and, and, and really to the table. So I hope that we can um, come back to that point um, during, during the Q&A. Um, and then last but not least, uh, of course, we'd love to hear from Sierra um, uh, to hear your take on sort of what are some of the key, connecting some of the key challenges in the work that you do um, to, to really what ought to be the priorities for, for the next mayor. Yeah, thank you so much for this question. I think, you know, I'm feeling a lot of resonance um, with what folks are saying and just want to underscore this idea of like self-determination and worker power. Um, I think the primary challenge for any mayor or any official is uh, listening and accepting the knowledge that our community have, has, had, ha has, has, um, and accepting that as truth. Like we know what we need and we just need to access the resources to create it, like James said. Um, I think that we need uh, to develop an economy and, and a base, to be honest, that honors this knowledge. Um, and we need to value the BIPOC community that lives here through active support of our work, right? Like you can't just create something and not fund it. Right? Like that's, that, that, that is just a name and it's not, uh, it's not real, it's not material. Um, I'm a very materialist person, uh, if you couldn't tell. So um, yeah, I think that just, you know, at Ujima, we have two governing bodies um, that have been voted on and elected by our community, by our voting members. Um, one is the Community Standards Committee and the other is the Investment Committee and they're democratically elected um, business and community leaders. And as a result of this, We've developed 36 standards based on community input at our assemblies that highlight the areas of work where we see need for improvement. So, you know, for example, we need workers to be paid a living wage. We need good jobs. We need good local jobs. Um, we need community ownership. We need a zero waste plan and we need green, green infrastructure. I think that these are all things like, you know, when we're talking about how communities ex exercise their agency, exert their power, practice democracy in the broadest terms, um, you know, this needs to be direct decision making on behalf of the economic, the local, I'm sorry, the social and uh, cultural operations in our community. It can't just be, again, a name, it needs to be um, in a reality. Uh, and so again, like honoring our needs, honoring our truth through self-determination, allowing people to self-determine um, what's real for them. This is another key word for, um, to add to David's list from earlier, right, is self-determination. Um, that that I think we um, maybe don't think about in a concrete sense uh, as to what it means, but I think you put it um, really beautifully, Sierra. Um, David, I, I'm going to turn it back to you for for our next uh, our next uh, question. Yeah, awesome. Yeah, thank you everyone for sharing. I mean, a lot everything that was said really just resonates with what I've seen and just growing up here, and especially gentrification, which is a huge issue um, affecting Black communities within Boston. Um, I think it is something that, again, we're calling for change, we're calling for a resolution. And sometimes, and I think with, you know, like with uplifting voices, sometimes it can feel unheard or feel like there's apathy towards, you know, just the dire situations and urgency that communities are going through. Um, and so, you know, it's just something that we have to keep pushing forward. Um, but getting into the next question. So as we all know, this mayoral race is gonna be a historic one for Boston. Like regardless of what the person does, what agendas, whatever, it will be historic again, because all of the previous mayors before have been white males. Um, and, you know, I really wanna ask everybody, what is the significance, if any, does this race serve for you in the context of your work? And maybe even more connected, you know, we have a lot of people, um, Sierra, you said you were a third generation Bostonian. We have people who are coming here for the first, basically coming here and people who've grown up here. And so we have a wide diversity of perspectives. And so what is the significance for you and your work as a change agent, but then also you personally as a Bostonian? And I wanna start it off with Sierra and hear your thoughts. 
Yeah, um, thank you. This video is loud, but uh, thank you so much for asking this question. Um, I think this one is a, this is a difficult question for me to answer because again, um, the more things change, the more they stay the same, right? I'm a third generation Bostonian and I'm still seeing and feeling the impacts of a lot of things that my grandmother went through when she first came uh, to Boston. Um, so uh, I think that while that is true, um, there's a real opportunity to uh, create more direct democracy in this race. Um, and obviously this race is an important one, but we need to, I think for me, move past representational, po representational politics and move towards like real active change um, because there's ongoing movements that again, have been happening and, and need to be honored as well. Um, so for example, uh, when we're thinking about uh, the power of direct democracy, you know, there's a question right now on, uh, on the ballot, yes on one, um, that could have significant impacts on how we budget. Um, so as I said before, I think, again, you know, honoring what people know um, and, and channeling that into real change. Thank you for sharing. Yeah, it is something that is just so difficult. I mean, you know, I've grown up in Roxbury, Dorchester, and I think as I've aged and seen how things have changed in the way where gentrification has transformed communities, but in the sense of just the overall communal wealth in the sense of economic wealth. I mean, I think that's fairly stagnant if, since I was a kid. And I mean, even looking at the racial wealth gap, I mean, a, a report from the Federal Reserve found that black communities in Boston were worth about $8 in terms of net worth. And that's including your assets and your debt. So there's a great amount of debt that's happening and it's something that needs to be resolved in, or if we're gonna really address this disparity. Um, so yeah, it's a, it's a very painful conversation. Um, Christine, do you mind sharing some of your thoughts? Not at all, thank you so much. Um, when I was looking at the candidates and just uh, listening a uh, few of their stories, I was like, yeah, this is a daughters of immigrants and I'm an immigrant. Uh, as I said, I came here 2000 and the challenge I went through, <laughs> they were enormous. And uh, that's, that's the reason I like to work with refugees and immigrants because I understand where they come from. I have been there before and I'm still an immigrant. Even if I've been here for uh, 20, more than 20 years, I still face some challenges of prejudice. And uh, I am hoping that they, uh, these candidates, because they are, they, are, they are female, they are daughters of immigrants, they understand, um, they, they will try to put themselves in the shoes of refugees and immigrants. And when I talk about refugees and immigrants, most of the majority of refugees and immigrants are people of color. So and I'm talking about black people, brown people, uh, I, I, I see a historic history because it never happened before. And uh, I was, when I was uh, reading, I was like, Where, what happened to Boston? We can do better than this. And uh, we missed so many opportunities. I hope this time we, we are going to see that the change is really needed. So I am really excited um, as a female, as an immigrant, that these uh, candidates are daughters of immigrants. And I'm sure they had stories of their uh, parents, their, their grandparents, or their other relatives who came here and uh, had to, to go through some challenges, learning the languages, uh, struggling how to, to get a jobs. And, and when we talked about the challenges, even those who are born here, people of color, there are, some of them are still having a hard time to, to get a higher paid jobs because of their, the skin of their color. So we have to break that. And I hope for these candidates, they will, just, will see some changes and they work hard to make sure that as people of color, we are remembered, they, are, they will fight for us. Thank you. Thank you, Christine. You know, what really resonated with me as you were speaking is that I am the son of an immigrant. My father and my grandparents came from Trinidad and Venezuela. And so in the 80s, when they came here, you know, they went through a litany of issues pertaining to education, pertaining to job attainment, and just all the stuff that still really persists today. And so, you know, it's something where hopefully the next mayor can also figure out a way to address that to make this city more welcoming and more equitable for everyone. So thank you for sharing your thoughts. Okay, next, uh, Paige, do you mind sharing? Yes, of course, and I so appreciate this question. I mean, I would definitely start by echoing some of what Sierra mentioned in terms of 
you know, while the mayoral election is an important one, it's not the only the only one um, and sort of only process that folks should be watching in terms of electoral activities. Um, there's obviously the city council races that are happening and definitely other local ballot measures that would allow for more direct democracy to happen um, year round. Right. So definitely important to ensure, make sure we're watching those as, as um, Boston residents as well. And I guess I would add that, you know, at Ajima, we really try, we really believe in everyday democracy, right? So the idea that there are ways we can actually live out democracy in the everyday. So in, in between large milestone elections like this, there are ways we can sort of take part in our government and take part in our communities. And that's why we do seek out collaboration so often and, and why we really want to co-create all of our work with our members and our partners. Um, so that principle of everyday democracy really underlies our democratic investment fund, the Ujima Fund, where members can actually vote to direct capital, right? But it also underlies a lot of our work um, overall. Thank you, Paige. Last but not least, James, do you mind sharing some thoughts? Yeah, ask the question again, please, sorry. Oh, yes, of course. Um, so, what significance, if any, does this race have uh, within the context of your own personal work and just you as a Bostonian? Yeah, this this uh, this this one is definitely interesting to me. I think that um, because we we have a black mayor right now um, that will soon to be transitioning out, um, and we have two sisters that are also you know up and running. For me, um, seeing how this race uh, or these races similar to when there are folks of color or black folk that are in the race, how it's the votes are being split and how that divides the community. Um, and to also see how, I mean, folks have their own opinion on who they wanna vote for, but uh, if you have policies uh, that you've passed or legislation that you've passed that mirrored or very similar to um, all the white men that were mayor beforehand, are you the person or should you deserve uh, a role in that, you know, should you take upon this position or do I believe? No. Um, and so with that being said, uh, I don't know if there's really gonna be change uh, because I mean, I'm a black man in this society and. Um, I have a black wife and I have black children and I haven't seen progress really being made unless it's a select a few of individuals um, who are handpicked. Uh, and with that being said, uh, I, I really don't know if I'll see change. Um, I think that it's, it's a harsh reality, but the fight never ends and, I, and um, the work continues and trust and believe that I will never remain stuck on replay because my duty is to continue to fight um, and continue to elevate and uplift our people and to figure out how can we disrupt these systems that were never set up for. So yeah, that's my answer and I'm sticking to it. No, thank you for the bluntness. I mean, it's, it's real, it's a real fact. You know, there have been great agents of change like Mel King and Chuck Turner who've come before us and have really paved the way and have done amazing work. Rest in peace to Chuck Turner. And, you know, it's still like something comes up, you know, so it's something next. And it feels as though we gain a step and then maybe three steps, you know, are taken away. It feels like that sometimes. And so, you know, the work that you all are doing is really truly transform transformational because Boston is not an easy place to really do civic engagement and really make change and especially on marginalized communities. Um, so yeah, I, I appreciate the bluntness. And also just too, with the comment that I made earlier about uh, the average net worth of black people being $8. So that's compared to about $250,000 for the average white family. And so um, it's a stark disparity. Um, but yeah, continuing the conversation, I wanna pass it to my co-moderator for the next question. Thank you, David. Um, picking up on a couple of threads that, that folks have mentioned um, in, in, in the previous um, set of comments, Wanted to, we wanted we were really interested in hearing from you guys about policy recommendations for making a more equitable Boston. 
Um, but really um, thinking about, um, you know, Sierra's point about direct democracy and Paige's uh, comment about um, uh, everyday democracy, um, and and really everything that 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 Paige and Christine have uh, that James and Christine have also said. Um, I'd love it if you could sort of think about it in the perspective of how um, how can we sort of flip uh, democracy or you know shake it up a bit uh, more um, so that people's voices are are the the the, the voices that um, politicians are, are are you know hearing from are not just the usual voices um, so that the communities of color the black communities immigrant communities refugees are are really the folks that are being centered in these conversations how concretely. Um, you know, can the next mayor make sure that those voices are incorporated, that people have a say, that their expertise is at the table, um, and that people's participation is not limited only to election day? Um, concretely, what are some ideas that you have, um, either that you've done in your own work and that you think um, really ought to be real concrete, you know, policy um, changes that the next mayor can can truly implement, um, listening to and centering the voices of, of, of Black communities, you know, immigrants, refugees, as, as we've said. And I think maybe we'll start with Paige, um, since we haven't started with you yet. Sure. So excited for this question. We love policy recommendations, right? I mean, um, so I mean, one thing that Udima has been really excited about is um, trying to push for broader support for um, public banking across the state of Massachusetts. So for those who don't know, there's actually a growing movement across the Commonwealth to bring a public bank to the state. Um, and, th and that's really a GMS flagship issue. This is really important to our work. Um, so right now there's actually a bill at the state level to establish the first public bank in the, in the state. And it would be a financially sustainable institution that is really trying to address the needs of small businesses, um, community development institutions and entities, land trusts, local ag entities, and frankly, folks who have been shut out of commercial lending historically, right? The communities, I think, who have been hit the hardest um, by our predatory policies there. This bank can really do a lot to, to return capital to those folks. Um, and we see it working very cooperatively with the sort of broader web of other banks as well. So it's not meant to be in competition with commercial lenders either. We see it very much as a collaborative effort there. So that's really our, our big policy um, effort is public banking and trying to get that started up in, in, in the state. And for folks who want to learn more about that, there's a really wonderful coalition that we are embedded in called the Mass Public Banking Coalition that's doing awesome work on this as well. Fantastic. Uh, yeah, absolutely. I mean, uh, that that's a really, um, it's just stunning the, the extent to which sort of communities being underbanked is tied to so many other um you know inequities and so i think that that's a real that, that can be a real game changer um if, if implemented so we hope we hope they're listening the may the new mayor's teams are listening and if not we're going to make them listen um so up next why don't we hear from james what are some you know ways that you think um you know some policies some concrete policy recommendations um for really creating a more equitable boston and as, as you've said like really centering the voices um, of affected communities yeah um uh to to be straight up you know uh 30 plus i would say 25 to 30 dollars an hour um as as a starting range for uh uh you know job opportunities um 15 dollars is nothing at all especially if you have children um I, i'll say that because i have children um i don't make 15 dollars however um, for those that do, or not even touching that yet, that's 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 troubling for me. Um, another thing is, uh, I think I had it, and my daughter just distracted me. <laughs> Sorry. Um, uh, so we have a charter. We have policies that that were created uh, that that did not allow us to be participate. Why? Why not re, like? Why not dismantle that charter? Why not dismantle these policies um, or structures that were created uh, without us and involve us and to be a part of that conversation um, and to actually implement uh, the changes of how the structures um, or the charter uh, or whatever policies that were put in place uh, to create uh local government um you know work effectively it's been working effectively for white folks and i think that is if we want if we want to talk about equitable then we need to make sure that we're part of that 
uh, that that not conversation, but the change and this, the, the disruption that needs to happen. Um, and we need to make sure that we're supporting our young um, people in education. Man. We, need, we need to stop taking the resources um, from our young people. Uh, and we also need to flood um, the resources uh, for our young people uh, in, in the education um, system, as well as with you know youth jobs. I mean, I, ne- I think our youth need uh, uh, 30 million in a, in a, a, a city budget to make sure that young folks as well, because they too are, uh, some of them are the breadwinners um, of their household uh, or, or for themselves. And they also need to be able to provide for themselves. Um, home ownership, um, more programs to access that. Um, I don't know the, the allocation amount, but, um, and I also wanna say that if we do the home ownership, that if there's 40, whatever support is given, that we don't have to pay that back <laughs> at all. Reparations. Um, I mean, I can go on and on, uh, but I'll just list that and really just pause. But uh, I won't let my foot off the gas with those recommendations that I that I just d- discussed. And so I'm 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 open to work with anybody who's willing to join me and pushing that forward with whoever is the next mayor. Thank you, James. Um, like you, my daughter is also here distracting me. Um, but yeah, I appreciate you centering um, the youth and, and the next generation and all of this. Um, uh, what do we hear next from um, Christine? And then Sierra can close us out um, in this round of conversation. You know, again, what are some policies um, that you think um, can really create a more equitable Boston centering the voices of, of affected communities? Thank you. Um... I'll echo with one of uh, James shared. I think to have equitable opportunity for people in Boston, especially black people, uh, we need a policy which creates a pathway for home ownership for uh, black people. And I believe 100% if that opportunity happens, uh, if we can make it as a black people, other people will make it too, because I've been making it with all those policies. So. Uh, I support that so much, and there is no way you can have that pathway without having wonderful, good opportunity, job opportunities, which way I can pay Black people very well. Uh, the research has found that Black people don't get promotions like other, other people of color or um, white people. So it's time to go back and think about Black people breathe this country. So jobs which can pay black people well. Without that, uh, Boston will continue to see a decrease of black people in the Boston area. And we're already having people living in Boston. So um, I would just say that in the, uh, those two, two things, if we can get those two things, we'll have a better Boston. Thank you, Christine. Um, I'm really thinking across, you know, David's mention of the 2015 Fed report um, and Yanilda's, uh, you know, mention of eligible communities. Um, you know, the Fed report was one of the things that actually spurred Ujima um, to begin with the cross study, uh, I'm sorry, the cross sector uh, study group in 2015. Um, that was like one of the primary catalysts <laughs> for Ujima. So um, I thank you for mentioning it. Um, and I'm really thinking about you know, the ways that we acknowledge and recognize, you know, those people and spaces that can't be seen through a traditional lens. Um, the ones that are produced by like BIPOC communities um, in the name of liberation, but also I'm thinking about like this common, I guess, pathology that uneven development is natural rather than produced, right? Like that, like, like that these things just happen. Um, and so I think one way, again, I'm gonna stress direct democracy, uh, cause that's super important to me. Like true power, true democratic power happens at when we can have a true grounded say in what's happening in our communities. Um, and as I mentioned earlier, participatory budgeting is like one way to promote equitable change. Right now, again, there's a question on the ballot, question one that can radically shift how our budgets are managed. Right now it's almost entirely managed by the mayor. Um, 
And I think that like this kind of engagement is, you know, a primary feature of, of Ujima, right? Like we get a say in where our money goes, uh, the 5 million that we've um, raised, right? But like, think about what that could do on a city level. Um, I just think that, you know, with this amendment to the city charter, we can have more control over how uh, these funds move through our communities and where they go. Um, you know, people want to defund the police, right? Like that can happen if we have more say over our budgets. Um, it's also worth noting that both mayoral candidates support this move towards more community voice and how we budget fairly and inclusively for everyone. Um, so I think that that's just a no brainer. <laughs> Thank you for that, Sierra. And, and, and again, for a, a true um, example of what part, of what direct democracy can, can look like and participatory budgeting is um, it's I mean, something that we can learn uh, here in the US from you know places throughout the world, including Brazil. Um, for how to really bring in um, the the voices of, of low income communities of Black communities um, in a in a more meaningful sense beyond just elections. Um, now I'd like to turn it over to to, to folks in the audience um, and and bring you in for some of the questions. And um, you can please ask uh, during through the Q and A function. Um, and I'll turn it over to David, who can ask who's going to ask the first couple of questions that we've received. Awesome. Um, so we, re we received a couple of questions um, and we're going to try to answer all of them. Um, but yeah, we'll, we'll see how much time we're able to get or how many we're able to get through. But the first question um, if from the audience is, is there excitement about November 2nd or is the lack of a black candidate, you know, lessening people's interests, uh, especially since we had two black mayoral, actually three black mayoral candidates um, and none of them were able to make it to the general. Um, so yeah, how, how do people feel? And we could do a round robin, you know, I'll call. Christine, do you mind starting us off? I don't mind starting. Um, I am sure, I don't live in Boston area. I work in Boston area, I wish I can vote, but uh, um, I am sure uh, Boston black people uh, feeling not excited. I'm, I'm just, I'm just assuming, and I, I think I'm, I'm right to say that uh, they are uh, kind of disappointed. And uh, I'll say Boston missed opportunity, but for me, I was not surprised at all um, because look how many years has been took to even have a female country to just be there to just uh, uh, campaign as as, as a, a a candidate. So. I, I was disappointed, but I'm not losing hope. <laughs> black people, we are fighters, have been fighting to get where we are. So I'm just telling my fellow black people, let's not be discouraged. Uh, let's keep uh, we let's keep pushing. Um, we fight to, to get where we are. We continue to fight until we have a black mayor. Uh, we had a, <laughs> we had a, a, a black governor once, and uh, we had a, a black president once. Things can happen. Let's keep working hard. Let's keep supporting one another and let, let not lose hope and don't stop voting. Please go vote November 2nd, who you want to present you and let that candidate, when they, 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 they become mayor, let's fight, let's work with them. Let's call them so we can sit together and just mention our challenges and what we go through. We can work together. I believe, I mean, I believe human beings can work together no matter what, no matter color. It's, it's just the will. If the will is there, uh, from Michelle Wu or Anissa, we can work together and we can bring some change, some changes. So it's up to the candidate, it's up, it's up to the voters in, in, in Boston, go vote, don't just stay home because there's no black candidate, you can still exercise your vote and then let's sit on the table with whoever will be a mayor and bring uh, some changes together. Hmm. Thank you, Christine. Does anyone else? Uh, Paige, you have any thoughts? This is where I expose myself as a, as a Cambridge resident. They will not be voting in the Boston Municipal. Um, but I can say that as um, I am from Atlanta originally, and Atlanta has had several Black mayors. And that's the thing that we do take a lot of pride in, in terms of the Black folks who do live in Atlanta in terms of setting that precedent. So I get the excitement, I get the sort of the, um, the, the, the need to want to see that in our local government. But I also think, you know, similar to, to Sierra, that there's a lot more to look, to look forward to beyond this election. There's so many ballot measures, there's so much grassroots work happening among our grassroots community and others. We're doing great work year round. Um, so I don't want us to lose sight of that. There, I, I hope there'll be, there'll be more diverse candidates in the future for mayor. I don't think 
like the last time we see this, hopefully. I think things are improving when it comes to the candidate pipeline. Um, so don't disparage. I mean, there's so much awesome work happening, um, you know, year round, not from regardless, is what I would say. Mm, thank you. Sierra? Um, sure. Um, do I think that the lack of a Black candidate will lessen people's interest in the mayoral, in the mayoral race? Um, I mean, I can't speak for most people. I will say that I think Boston is a very conservative city. Um, and so again, like Christine, it doesn't surprise me um, that, you know, uh, no candidates have, uh, uh, no Black candidates have made it to um, the general race. Um, I will say, you know, for me, again, like, um, while I love Black people, like representational politics um, don't move me. Um, and as Paige said, you know, like there are lots of communities or some communities, maybe not a lot, but some communities that have had um, Black mayors. Um, so I, I see myself and I see our communities as uh, needing to do deep work, right? Like deep organizing work. Um, to make sure again that they like access those pipelines um, and that there and that people know that there is more work to be done outside of making sure that uh, mayor is in office. Um, there are lots of opportunities, as Paige said, for people to get involved, for people to do the work um, that are outside of the ballot box and inside of the ballot box. Um, thank you. Thank you. Uh, and James, any thoughts? Yeah, no, no excitement. Um, you know, for me, accountability has no shade. Um, so uh, just making sure whoever is elected is held accountable to whatever it is that they said that they would do and hoping that most of what they said they would do are not based off of their own individualized policies or thoughts, um, but it's coming strictly from uh, community members um, across Boston. Um, and I really just want to make sure that... Uh, uh, but I, what I am excited about, though, um, is so my there the there is a group called New Democracy that recently just put posters up all around Boston that says just vote. And, you know, on my way to dropping my, my kids off to school, my son asked, hey, dad, what's just vote? I'm like, what do you think it is? And he's like, um, it's for the president and vice president. I say. Yeah, that's part of it, you know. Like that's that's that, that that's a decision that people vote and elect people into office that re that that are supposed to represent people um, across this country. But what about? Uh, but then I had to share with him about you know other representations on the federal level, the U.S. Senate, uh, the U.S. Uh, representatives um, on the state level, the the state representatives, the state senators, and then on the city level, the at large and um the the city council i didn't dive into like all of the other elected positions just yet in due time i'll get there but i'm excited to teach them about this moment and other kids about this moment and so that they are informed and so when they um are us there will be someone that will have the same values that we may have and i'm, I'm speaking as a black man so for black folk um, that will be beneficial for Black folk. Um, and again, accountability for me has no shade. And I want to state that once again, but uh, yeah, no excitement. Thank you, James. I mean, I think what really resonates with me is more so that we're trying to set the groundwork or the environment so that when the next generation comes, they don't have to go through the same barriers and the same pitfalls that we did. Um, so very much agree with that. And we have one question that we actually received before um, the panel, and it's an audience question. Uh, and so just really quickly, and anybody can answer if you don't feel, you know, like in a sense, move to, you don't necessarily need to. Um, but how can students best support the work that you're doing? Um, is it joining your organization slash volunteering? Or is it doing aligned work on campus? Or yeah, what are some thoughts? of how people can get engaged. I, I can go yeah. first. Go, go ahead, go ahead. Yeah, at, uh, at the middle question, um, uh, we have so many opportunities to, to join. You can be an intern or you can do, we do citizenship clinics. Um, 
uh, you can always volunteer to do citizenship clinics. And uh, we do voter registration too. You can uh, volunteer for doing that. Uh, there's so many ways to just uh, join our organization. And uh, there's some other campaigns. Uh, we advocate for so many policies. So if you can visit our website, you can see so many opportunities to uh, join. So uh, if you Google Mira Coalition, you'll be, you'll be able to see it. Uh, so uh, there's so many ways to be involved in our organization and many opportunities to volunteer. So, um, yeah. Yeah, um, thank you, Christine. And I'll just say quickly, um, I won't talk about Eugene in specific, but I'll just talk in general. Um, I'd say th your first step is finding out what you're interested in, right? Like there's a lot of work being done across a lot of sectors. Um, Ujima is an ecosystem, but we're unique in that fact. Um, and we work with a lot of grassroots peers to make sure that we're moving with them on the organizational and uh, state level, you know, all of the change that we need to see in our world, right? So like find a black or, indi or indigenous led organization, find a black or brown uh, led organization, um, wherever you are, you know, in Boston, there's City Life Vita Urbana, there's Matahari, um, there's Black Mass Coalition. Um, nationally, there's like the movement for Black Lives. There's, there's a lot out there, right? Um, go to a meeting that they're having. Listen <laughs> at that meeting, right? Um, ask the organization about ways that you can uh, be supportive. And then after that, stay engaged. Um, you know, if you want to join Ujima or if you want to learn more about us, you can visit our website, ujimaboston.com. Um, and you can, you know, watch our videos, read our stuff, you know, just learn about us. And then if you do decide um, that you are interested enough to come to a meeting, um, every week we have Ujima Wednesdays um, from 6 to 8.30 p.m. Um, and just join us, come listen, learn. This month we're studying artist political power. I think that again, worker power, we experience the same things across a variety of sector, whether you are a domestic worker or you're an artist, there is exploitation at every level. Right, so like we don't necessarily, uh, you can find ways to make it applicable. Um, so again, uh, I'd say go to a meeting, find an organization that you like, go to a meeting and listen. I guess I'm the last person. Yeah, uh, you, I mean, I echo everything that everybody said, I mean, as really it the only thing that i would say is if your parents got money donate donate to you know the organizations we need money you know um and you know be not just an ally but an advocate on the city level the state level and a federal level as well um sometimes it does sometimes it's not the messenger that that uh it's sometimes uh the messenger tends to you know be shot down a lot because uh obviously we may be aggressive like myself um or we may agitate folks that are in power who need to do their job better um however uh we would love to have some of y'all to help support if if you feel the need to to join us um in the fight for more equitable access to resources and opportunities for our people in Boston. So that's all. Thank you, James. Now I'm gonna pass it over to my co-moderator to close this out. Thanks, David. Um, I don't know if we heard from Paige in that last question. I don't know if there was anything else that you wanted to add from Jima's perspective. No, I think no? so. Good? Okay. Yeah, of course. Um, well, as um, as David said, we are, uh, we're at, time now for our event, uh, but this is really the first of what we hope will be many conversations um, about this question of sort of how do we um, give, uh, you know, share, I think what uh, James just said is really important, right? It's, it's sort of how do we share the resources and the platform of a place like Harvard for those, you know, those of us that are located here um, to support um, Black and Brown communities, Indigenous communities, um, refugees, immigrant communities here in, in Boston and, um, and beyond. Um, and so we really hope you'll take to heart everything that folks have just said that we've just heard from from Christine, from James, from Sierra, and from Paige. Um, be on the lookout for um, the next um, conversation in the in this series, um, which will take place after the mayoral election um, takes place. So be on the lookout for um, for that. Um, just as a reminder, uh, once again, the last day to vote in the general election will be October 13. Um, at sorry, the last day to register. 
um, will be October 13 at um, at 8 p.m. And uh, we'll post again the links um, in the chat to look up your voter registration or, or to register to vote. Um, once again, uh, a huge thank you um, to the Ash Center um, for hosting this conversation, as well as all of our um, co-sponsors for making this possible. And a special uh, thank you to David um, for thinking about how to, again, how to use um, all the resources um, and knowledge and platform uh, of an institution like Harvard and bringing it together with the knowledge, uh, the resources, the expertise, experiences of, of Boston's Black communities and um, the great community leaders we've heard from today. Um, so stay tuned. This is, um, this is just the start uh, of the conversation. Um, so thank you, everyone.